Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Aisha Tyler. The Tron Cole Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz, Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim. And you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hey, this is Elliot Einhorn. Welcome back to the Talk House Podcast. Today I'm joined from Chicago by... Hey, it's Josh Modell. We have a very powerful show today featuring Craig Finn of The Hold Steady, Katie Harkin of Harkin and Slater Kinney, and Grammy-winning producer Peter Cadis discussing Frightened Rabbit. Josh, tell me how this came together. Well, it's a long and mostly sad story that involves the suicide of Frightened Rabbit singer Scott Hutchison back in May of 2018. Before his death, the band had actually kind of been working on a tribute to itself. It was the 10th anniversary of their breakthrough record, The Midnight Organ Fight, which came out in 2008. A beautiful record. Amazing record. Literally a top 10 record of all time for me. And rather than do kind of like a straight reissue, they had planned a tribute album featuring all their friends, right? So they got a hold of friends of theirs to do a track-by-track cover of The Midnight Organ Fight. Including all three of our guests today. Exactly. So the release of that tribute was delayed for obvious reasons, but it finally came out last month and TalkHouse hosted an event at Rough Trade in Brooklyn, gathering these three folks to kind of talk about the original, to talk about the tribute album, which is called Tiny Changes, and to talk about Scott Hutchison's legacy. Now, Frightened Rabbit formed in the 2000s in Scotland. And as you mentioned, Josh, they broke through in a pretty huge way with 2008's The Midnight Organ Fight. We're going to be hearing a lot about that record in today's podcast. The band released five records and toured the world. Yeah, they had a pretty incredible run. Like you said, that record is the one that broke them out, but they ended up getting bigger and bigger, playing bigger venues in the United States, certainly headlining festivals all over the world. You know, I think it was a shock to everybody when Scott died last year. But these folks didn't join us at Rough Trade in July for a eulogy. They joined us to celebrate Tiny Changes, which itself is a celebration of the Midnight Organ Fight. Which brings us to uh, our our first guest, Peter Cadis. He's a musician and Grammy-winning producer who has worked with Interpol, The National, Yonsi. Peter produced Midnight Organ Fight, and his band, The Philistines Jr., contributed a track to Tiny Changes. So yeah, let's hear a little bit of Philistines Jr.'s Bright Pink Bookmark. It's kind of a funny track to cover because on the original Midnight Organ Fight, it's this short linking track, kind of background vibe to get you from one part of the record to the other. But Cadis and his band kind of made it into something bigger and different. That's just such a cool reimagining. Definitely. Most of the tracks on this compilation are interesting takes. Another one that's really cool comes from our next guest, Katie Harkin, who actually got together with actor-comedian Sarah Silverman, another huge Frightened Rabbit fan, to cover the track My Backwards Walk. Yeah, it turns out that Sarah Silverman and Katie actually chose the same track to cover and were paired to work on it together with very cool results. Katie got her start in the band Skylarkin, and has really made her name as the fourth member of Slater Kinney and a touring musician for Courtney Barnett, Kurt Vile, and, and so many more greats. So the members of Frightened Rabbit put Harkin and Sarah Silverman in touch, and they actually didn't even end up meeting in person until after the song was done, which is kind of cool. Let's take a listen to their version of My Backwards Walk. Really beautiful stuff there. Who who knew Sarah Silverman could sing, Josh? Yeah, uh, anybody who's expecting, you know, a punchline is going to be sorely disappointed. Yeah. Although that song ends with a great lyric that's pretty goddamn funny. You're the shit and I'm knee deep in it. <laughs> Classic Scott Hutchinson there. Yep. 
Our final guest on the panel is uh, someone who's appeared on our podcast many times now. I think he's been on the most of any other artist, Craig Finn. Now, Craig is, of course, a critically lauded songwriter and founder of The Hold Steady. He's had a longtime friendship with the band and shares some pretty great stories about playing with and hanging with Scott and co in this talk. Yeah, definitely. And he gets the honor of doing Head Rolls Off, which is the song whose lyric talks about tiny changes. When my blood stops, someone else's will fall. When my head rolls off, someone else's will turn. so cool to hear Craig cover a song that meant so much to him. Yeah. And it was really cool to hear him talk with Peter and Katie about so much really great stuff and you know, make kind of something positive about this whole thing. You know, they talked about how Frightened Rabbit kind of evolved as a band over the years from these two brothers into this, you know, five-piece behemoth. We get to hear all about the making of the Midnight Oregon fight and all of their favorite stories about Scott. Yeah, and we get into a real substantive discussion by the end of musicians and mental health, which I think all three of these people have really interesting, important things to say about. We also get to hear what Scott's hilarious take was on a track by The National. Yep, they talk about their favorite Frightened Rabbit lyrics. Katie drops a brilliant equation that musicians should definitely keep in mind. They talk a little bit about the tribute concert that took place on the very same stage last December, which was really a moving thing. And so much more. Should we roll the tape? Definitely. But real quick before we do, I think most people know that talk house conversations are generally unmoderated. In this one, I was actually on stage with these three. I'm a huge Frightened Rabbit fan. I was real friendly with Scott. And I felt like it'd be good to be up there to kind of help move things along. So if you hear a fourth voice, that's mine. Let's do it. Yeah, man. Let's hear it. Let me introduce Peter Cadis. <laughs> Craig Finn. And Katie Harkin. Uh, I'm mostly going to sit over here quietly, but uh, I'd like you guys to kind of talk about how you first came to know of, and eventually maybe came to know, Frightened Rabbit. But otherwise, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quiet. So please. So here we go. Yeah, let's My do first. it. All you, Peter. <laughs> I guess, uh, well, I also play in a band called The Philistines Jr. We have a song on the record, but uh, the drummer in our band, joined our band when he was 16 in 1992. His name was Adam Pierce. And then about, I guess, 12 years later, he started working for Fat Cat Records. And I guess they signed a band called Frightened Rabbit. And uh, he said, Pete, you got to record this Scottish band, Frightened Rabbit. I was like, okay. So, um, and the first record we recorded was Midnight Organ Fight. And yeah, I just met them to, to make that record. And uh, I worked on the second one, too. We mixed uh, Winter of Mixed Drinks. Well, whatever. The first record is Sing the Grace. My dad and fight the next one. But, and then our band toured with Frightened Rabbit a little bit years later. And then he's just, you know, became a good buddy. And that's it. So, I've been thinking about this a lot. I, I've gotten this question. And my friend Chris Newmeyer was helping to manage Fr Frightened Rabbit. I think that's how I also became aware of Philistines and Peter and uh, his brother and, and a bunch of things. Chris was helping to manage Frightened Rabbit and he said, you got to check this out. And um, I, I don't know if he sent me the record or I just sort of followed his recommendation and got it. Um, and I liked it a lot. I don't honestly remember meeting or how exactly I met them for the first time. Um, it was in a period of my life where I was on tour all the time and it's all a little blurry, 07 to 09. But at some point, by, by the end of that period, we were friends. And uh, they were in my life since then. Um, 07, 09 as well for me. I first met Frightened Rabbit on one of the first shows I ever played outside of Yorkshire where I grew up. Uh, I grew up in Leeds and I started a band when I was 18 called Skylarkin and we got asked to play a Freshers event. Do you say Freshers here? It's the first week of college uh. where there's a party every night and I think it was like the Indie Society had an event uh, and they invited us up to Edinburgh and we played... 
a fairly empty room uh, with Frightened Rabbit, but we were just so excited to play with them and they became real kind of big brothers and mentors to us. So that was the first show we played with them and I was really struck by their bond as a real tribe of musicians. And we ended up playing a bunch of shows again, can't quite remember, in the Beery 07, 09. And they took us on our first tour of bigger venues. Yeah. Uh Uh-oh, back to me. (laughs) (laughs) I think one a good place that I've been sort of waiting to ask this, but this record that came out today, Tiny Changes, is a tribute to Midnight Organ Fight, and it's obviously a classic record. I'm sure most people in this room feel the same way. There's one person in this room, Peter, that was at least one, but for sure one, uh, that was there when they recorded it. So I'm, I'm curious personally on like what the process was like. Do you remember how long it was? I'm sorry, I should know more precisely. I thought about it coming in. It was a quick record, and I know there was a lot of anxiety going into it about making it fast enough um, because Fat Cat is a great label, but it's not a, not a big budget thing. So I do remember the day they were coming, I went out for a run, and I was like, I got plenty of time again because Adam is always late for everything, and he was bringing them. But, um, and I get back, and they're in my driveway, and I'm soaking with sweat. I'm like, hey, guys. And, uh, but I, I think we spent... It's possible it was a week, but I'm pretty sure two weeks recording the record. And then because they were so worried about money, um, Adam had a studio uh, up, you know, up in upstate New York. And he's like, we're going to go up there. We're going to do uh, guitar overdubs and then we'll come back. So they went up there for like a week and did guitar overdubs and some vocal overdubs. And then came back for probably another, probably just a week. I don't know. I, I, don't, I find it hard to believe it was more than a three or four week record. And they came back and we put it all together and mixed it. But it was, you know, that's when they were still totally just a three-piece band, okay. and, which was kind of cool because with no bass player, there's all that space, and then you get to add bass when you want to, which was really fun. And, uh, but, uh, you know, they both played guitar. And, you know, and, so, and so who, who was it? It was... it was Scott and Billy and Grant. Yeah, that's that what I it. figured. And, and, and Scott and Billy both, both played guitar. Okay, okay. And did you guys record it? On the floor, like with drums, bass, and guitar? Yeah. Drums, guitars, and guitars playing all together at once? Pretty much. There's some songs that are piano-based. And, you know, there were a few songs, too, just for the sake of trying to get some kind of live energy. I'm not really a purist. I'll do whatever it takes to get it done. But so I did some things I don't normally like to do. It was like, for some reason, we recorded the acoustic guitar in the same room as the drums, which is a terrible idea. I don't remember why, but we just thought we had to. And then one time we did upright piano with the live drums too. And then, <laughs> so this is, this is not a compliment. Someone asked me the other day about the piano sound, and I can't remember which song. One of the, it's like, is that real or is that fake? I'm like, oh, that's, that's, not, that's not a good thing. But it's real, but it's mostly the DI. On the, like it's, the mics were just all drums and cymbals. So it's mostly the DI on the piano, which sounds kind of fake. Sure. Um, I guess part of the thought was I had seen them live one time before we made the record. I was in London, and randomly they were playing, and I got there late, and I saw one song. I saw them play Sing the Grays, but I could just tell, too, from the demos, you know, the point was to try to capture their live, raw energy, so yeah. we did try to do that, you yeah. know. Do you remember your first, like, uh, seeing them live? or Were they a three-piece when you saw them first? I, I have... Lots of different memories of seeing this band live. And as many memories of their shows are about watching the crowds, because that's the cool thing about being a support band is like you get to watch a band from the side of the stage. And so you also get to watch the crowd. And I was just so struck by the emotion coming back at the band from the crowd, especially from men, especially from big, hairy Scottish men. Um, <laughs> and when I, yeah, um, when I was, approaching this song, I was looking back through my, you know, pictures from the time and I've got a photo from that tour and you know when you take a picture in a really sweaty room with a disposable camera, it just kind of goes white. So it's, it's kind of the band and the crowd but it's mostly just like droplets of sweat. And this is at Barrowlands in Glasgow which is not a small venue. Um, it's a big old ballroom. But those songs expanded to fit whatever size room I played with them in. And I played with them in rooms ab- above pubs. And then I got to play with them in places like Barrowlands. And it just seemed like the emotion would swell and the crowd would swell. And yeah, it was all a white blur. I don't think I ever saw them until they had more members. Um, I, was a, I was a fan. And actually, when I, when I first heard of them, they, Chris, my friend Chris Neumeyer had also said, you know, they're fans, so you guys should meet. Uh, so... 
we were kind of in in contact, but I, until I, I I saw him live first time at the Williamsburg Music Hall, I believe, and um, they were already at least a four or five piece, and uh, we hung out that night. We we caught up. We 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 spent definitely some time together uh, after the show. <laughs> I keep hearing all these stories about how great it was to party with those guys. I think they looked at me more like dad. So I don't think we never par- <laughs> partied super hard, but uh, but I, it's funny having seen them so many times from so long ago. Like I remember the the first show they played for Midnight Organ Fight was at Mercury Lounge, and they just looked so nervous. I, but they're sorry if they're listening to this, of guys. But they they did look really nervous in it. It wasn't a great show, but the, and I think when they were nervous in those days, they would just try to play louder and louder and louder. Like, I, and then I saw them like within a year after that in, up in, in Providence, Rhode Island, at a small club, low ceiling. And I remember it was so loud that like it actually like my chest felt like it was compressing. They were they just that's what they would do is just use volume. But then when when we toured with them in like 2013, it, they were a completely different band. I remember like uh, their encore was Backwards Walk, and I think it would end. You know, like. The end of that song is cool, you know, you know how, how it kicks in, you're the shit and I'm needy, but it, it's just kind of groovy. But it, by this point, it was like, like stadium rock, you know, strobe lights, rah, and it worked. It was fantastic, but it was, you know, very high production value, you know, as opposed to the, the scrappy guys a few years earlier. Do you remember when you recorded the record, was there, I mean, what was your feeling on making the record? Was it, this is a classic. This is going to be the record we're going to be doing a podcast about 10 years later. <laughs> or was it like, oh, this made a record. It was good. I feel like I made so many records that no one gave a shit about that I liked that I was, I, I actually kind of thought, God, this record's so good, no one's going to like it. I really, because I really did like it. The, the thing that did surprise me though, that there were a bunch of songs that I loved on the record. And there were a bunch of songs I didn't think were that good. Now, those, some of those songs I didn't think were that good are really good songs. I don't even want to say the names right now. <laughs> I mean, one story I remember is that I think um, Head Rolls Off was not supposed to be on the record. That was like a, like yeah. a B-side or a throwaway track. And then this is my understanding that the, um, the band went and made a video for it. Yeah. You guys all know that video with the class, kids in the classroom. Again, there are a bunch of things, like there's a thing where the, that video where the guys find the lion and the lion loves the weather. Anyway, it's a video that makes me cry every time. So like... It's really beautiful. But I guess they made that video and the label's like, oh, we got to put it on the record. So, thank goodness. Bands know better than labels then, is that what Sorry. you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys want to talk a little more about Tiny Changes? I don't know if everyone knows, but Tiny Changes was finished before Scott's death. He heard everything on the record. Um, and I, one thing interesting that I learned from Grant is that he told me there weren't really labels involved, that it was really the band approaching you guys directly and trying to make it really sort of a personal thing. So how did they how did they approach each of you? I can say that I was thinking about this that Bill, Billy actually was the one who was mainly texting me um, cuz we we're, were the most in contact when we we're apart and he was like you know you got to do this you should record the song and I said I love to. And then I remember thinking like well I got it done you know, which is, is someone from the label going to contact me or management or something? And they're like, oh, they haven't yet. And I'm like, are they shoehorning me into something that the label doesn't want? Like, I, I definitely got that feeling like that it was going to be like Coldplay and Radiohead. And they were like, no, you got to put our friend Craig on there too. <laughs> um, but when, then I, I understood it later, but I, I really was, I was kind of paranoid that I was get like, they were trying to invite me to a party that I wasn't welcome at. <laughs> But uh, that's what so they did. They they said, and we ended, we joked at one point about um, a lot of my music talks about Jesus. So uh, they said, you know, if you ever did a Frank Rabbit song, it should be Head Rolls Off because yeah. um, it says Jesus is just a Spanish boy's name, and it would be kind of a funny thing. And so I was like, yeah, though that's the song I should do. And um, you know, as you said, that this record was recorded under different circumstances than the how it came out, and it was recorded. I know my version. It was at least a few months before Scott passed. So. It, you know, I know I went in and wanted to make sort of a breezy celebratory version of the song. And I, I have a hard time knowing or saying that I would make the same version now. Um, but I'm kind of glad that it was recorded under those circumstances and, and we were able to just kind of make something that was more fun and celebratory. Yeah. Hell yeah. Got a hell yeah over here. So. <laughs> um, it was Grant that originally approached me um, saying, because we had the touring history, did I want to be involved? And I said, yes, absolutely. 
Um, and then he kind of said, oh, well, actually, Scott's got an idea for a song. And then he said, um, Sarah Silverman has also picked the same song as you. Would you mind doing it as a duet? And I said, that's wild. <laughs> that's a wild, wild idea. Um, and I, I just think it speaks to his skill as a master connector of people. That like even within this record, even within the creation of that, he was like connecting two people that he thought would creatively work well with each other um, let alone like connecting us to each other and us to all of you and everyone listening so yeah I continue to be moved by it and I I didn't meet Sarah until after um, he passed so it we became like pen pals like creative pen pals sending back kind of mixes back and forth and then became sort of pen pals in in grief together so I just, I'm, I'm so grateful that I was connected to this project somehow. And I'm not saying that Bright Pink Bookmark is a throwaway track, but it is kind of the <laughs> run to the litter, maybe. <laughs> so, um, and I think, you know, I saw Scott at the Bowery Ballroom show, or in all the guys, uh, the sort of 10th anniversary of Midnight Organ Fight. And we had a great time together. That time we did go out and party, and it was fun. <laughs> but in fact, that's the last time I ever saw Scott, and I've, I've never seen him so happy. It was a, just such a great night out, which made it so weird. But um, And then right after that, they asked me to do the cover. So I know I was kind of a last-minute ask. I don't, I don't feel bad about it. But, and, so, and of course, that was one of the only songs that I didn't work on because it was, I think, you know, when the record was done, they did that, and they did, um, you know, the final track on the record, this is little interstitial sort of things. And so my response was to make this sort of ridiculously over-the-top Three and a half minute epic version of this forty second song. <laughs> I, I couldn't resist because you know when I st- it's sort of several different versions of what it could be, and every time I did one, it's like oh that's not good enough. So it just I just made it longer and longer. But <laughs> well, that's pretty genius in of itself, getting you involved on the track that you weren't involved with. So yeah. it's kind of like <laughs> yeah, going sense. in a time machine and seeing what would have happened. <laughs> yeah, nice. So, but I've I've not heard the record yet, so I can't wait to hear it. It's available for sale right outside. I'm, I'm really cheap. I want to get one for free. I think there's probably somebody here that could. I, uh, I, I, I listened to it today, the covers record today for the first time, and it struck me how well I knew the original record. Like, I was like, all right. I knew I could tell you what song was going to come next. You know, even in this, in this era of listening to everything on shuffle, and, and, you know, it was an album that's really embedded into my, into my soul as far as like, okay, you know, here's here's the intro to the next song, and I knew I knew what was coming the whole time, even on these different versions, or at least I knew what the song, what I was expecting. Um, which, you know, I can't say that a lot about a lot of the a lot of records that are created in the last ten or fifteen years that I know that well. You know, it's funny though, is that's not true for me at all because we mastered it in a completely different order at first, <laughs> and I kept that CD. I didn't I didn't get the final order at first so I had the, the wrong order in my car for like a year so to me I Feel Better is still the first track so, oh, so wow. Like <laughs> wow so but <laughs> and but, arguably it would be probably the last era in which we all really consumed music like that you know an album like exclusively albums in order you know yeah yeah there's something special about that too maybe 10 years from now we'll be talking about songs and, and and not albums, you know. The podcast will be about Old that. Town Road. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have a ten-year-old, so as, my wife called me up be. because I, I I was insulting to him by telling him it was a terrible song. <laughs> I'm so, I was I'm sorry. Maybe it's great, but uh, no. But the uh, I, actually, when we started the record, I was convinced that uh, Fast Blood would be the lead-off track because that was sort of the song, I think, was like their opening song for, show, for shows at that time. And I think it would have made a great lead-off track, but I think, yeah, Modern Leopard just turned out so well. Although I do remember the first time, again, I played it for Adam Pierce, who was, you know, fat cat who brought the band to me, and the first thing he said, oh, the B-string's flat. I'm like, oh, oh. no. <laughs> and it is, but it's, it's, it's still okay. You know, I was listening to the OG record, this week, earlier this week. And um, what struck me is that something I hadn't thought of in a long time or maybe ever about the record is that some of its power, I mean, it's obviously a very emotional record. It's very hard on its sleeve, but it's frank in the sense, it's not like when I think of, you know, being emotive in 2019, I think of like real chest pounding, you know? 
um, kind of being overwrought almost. And this is not that it, in, in, in a very good way. It, it speaks very frankly about emotions. So it's, it's almost like he lays it plain. And, and especially I think about sex. You know, there's so many lines on that record that are just kind of these like, whoa, he said that, you know? And I really, my, my takeaway this week was that there's so much power in his writing on this record because of his sort of frankness and willing to just sort of say things that maybe we, we, we don't say or we don't feel comfortable to say. Which is not very British, and of course they're, they're <laughs> Scottish. But um, as an as a English person, I think it was so wonderful to see how well they were being received in America because it's not usually the bands that you like that necessarily are the ones that cross over. So to know that, you know, Frank and Rabbit were coming here and, yeah, maybe they were nervous, but they were, you know, doing very well. Um, and I think it's part of that raucous vulnerability, you know, that, that really was such a universal language. I hope this doesn't come off badly, but I have a bunch of stories about, you know, at first, sometimes when you hear a song, you don't totally get it like it, but it's even more extreme when you're starting to record a song because it's not formed in any way. So there were more than a few times, starting with when I, I was sent, not a demo, I was sent Sing the Grays. And, you know, we get sent a lot of stuff, so my assistant would listen to stuff and tell me if it's good or bad. And he listened to it and said, it's okay, but um, I don't think the guy can sing. And then I listened to it, and I was like, I think he can sing. I think he's going for like an off-the-rails kind of thing. You know, it's like, well, we'll see, you know. And uh, anyway, but I remember too, then like uh, when we were making the record, and I went to play, I play hockey at night, whatever. So I went to play hockey, I came back, and I asked my assistant, so how's it going? He's like, well, we just did this song, uh, Backwards Walk. And, he, and, he, and it's like, the lyrics are really silly at the end. And I, and like, I, I'm throwing people totally under the bus here, but this is true. And then someone else, when they heard the first line, you know, Jesus is just, yeah. he's like, oh, uh, yeah, the, the lyrics are really silly. You know, all these people I'm mentioning now absolutely love all those songs in the band. So that's why I can say that. And then I'll even throw myself under the bus about... Um, Keep yourself warm. Because I remember when we were making that, you know, making the song, whatever, the first time anyone heard those lyrics, they would be like, what the fuck is this? You know, they, you know, and, you know, now of course it's incredible, but, you know, a lot of producers talk about everything. They talk about lyrics. I never talk about lyrics with the band. To me, I feel like that's not anything to do with me. So, but I was like, hmm, that lyric is pretty, it can be really off putting and whatever. Like, I never, and I was like, I don't know, is there, any variation on that we could come up with? And Scott was like, I don't know, sure, maybe, whatever. And then like, we talked to him and stuff like that. And then I was like, no, 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 forget it, forget it, forget it. Because I would, wouldn't, so forget it. And so um, I told Scott that story when I saw them playing in Connecticut just a couple of years ago. And he totally threw me under the bus. He walked on stage and told that story and he said, but I decided not to change it. And the crowd goes nuts. And I was like, fuck oh, yeah. <laughs> I, did, I well, agree, it, don't change it. But. It's, it's undeniably his voice. Like when you listen to it, that is... I mean, first of all, it's a Scottish voice. I don't know what the Scottish equivalent of it it was, but at the time I was living in Cardiff and there were so many Welsh bands singing in uh, American accents that people would say Cardiffonia. Um, <laughs> so to hear bands like Biffy Clyro and Frightened Rabbit like singing in their own accents, you know, as a person from Yorkshire, I, I particularly love that. And it was interesting approaching this cover that was going to be me and an American woman both singing the same song. And I didn't actually know how much of the song Sarah was going to sing because obviously I wanted her to like do whatever she was comfortable with. And when I sent her the track and she'd sung it all the way through, I, I just thought it was so lovely to have our voices in unison because neither of us is a Scottish man. <laughs> so some, somewhere in between the two, it was like, we can do something that's like completely different, but honoring it and then doing it as like such a close duet. It felt like there wasn't any thought that I was going to be trying to do like a Scott impression, you know, mm. especially given the events of last year. Yeah. There was a tribute here in December where um, a couple of artists, including myself, did some of Scott's songs and there was talk at Soundcheck like you don't can't slip into your American <laughs> fake Scottish accent like <laughs> you know that would be a bad faux pas yeah. um, but it was it, it, it's sort of it's part and parcel of the music it's, it's how you think of it it's one of the it's one of the things like that, that was charming to me when I first heard it and one of the things you love about it yeah. I remember um, after the first record came out I, 
again, it was right when my son was born, I was like changing his diapers and I had NPR on and All Things Considered was on. And someone was being interviewed who had a Scottish accent. I was like, God, every person now, Scottish person sounds like Scott Hutchison to me. <laughs> and I keep listening in like, in like 30 seconds later. And that was Scott Hutchison from Frightened Rabbit. I was like, oh my God. I mean, that was a big deal that they were on yeah. All Things Considered, so. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the UK, anything outside of London is still considered regional. So it's a big deal. It is a big deal. Uh, I don't want to get particularly maudlin, but do you guys have any Scott stories you'd like to tell? Uh, you know, pretend we're just kicking around in a bar. I feel like everyone who met him loved him, and he was such a sweet man. And I feel like everybody's got at least one story. Maybe you guys have told some already, but... I mean, the last time I saw Scott... The whole steady was playing in London, and the, the agent um, called up and basically said, uh, "Hey, we forgot to deal with support bands." And um, the shows were sold out, so it was like you know, it wasn't it wasn't like we were trying to sell tickets. But I was like, "Well, what are we going to do?" And I happened to notice that Fright and Rabbit was playing outside of London the next night, and I said, "There's an opportunity here." So I got in touch with Scott and said, "Would you come and play solo? We don't have to announce you. You can just do it." You don't have to, you know, like pressure's off, but it'd be cool, give you some money. And he did it. And um, he came out, and I I think we announced him day of, I can't exactly remember, but he came out with a guitar at um, the Electric Ballroom in London and played his songs. And, you know, the the fans, the Hold Steady fans were, there's a huge overlap of Frightened Rabbit fans, so the fans were super excited. And, uh, you know, people were singing along, and I, I got to watch the show from the side of the stage, and at the end of the night, my girlfriend was there. I don't know if she'd met him before, so that was got to introduce, and we, you know, we, we all hung out and had some drinks, and uh, it was a really, really beautiful memory. And um, I feel really, really fortunate that that was the last time um, I got to hang with Scott, and um, that is a, a, a you know, a, a bright spot and a dark cloud that um, I feel really good about that last that last time. I remember that he was he was a listener as well as being like so gregarious and so raucous and you know we'd we'd play shows and I'd be playing new songs or just you know playing to a room of people that didn't know the band and it would be Scott afterwards that would come up and be like what was that lyric you know what what was that word and I, I just think that just speaks to his generosity as an artist as well as as a person because you know that's not always the experience that you have as a support act and and that's fine, and you're always grateful. But just the fact that like somebody I respected so much was listening so closely at a time when I was not used to being heard at all was was everything. And it just meant that you know those shows were just beyond formative. And the fact that they kept asking us to to play with them, you know, when you've got a band that you respect, putting their faith in you repeatedly, you know. It's what makes you drive to the other end of the country in a van where the heating's broken and you've got five quid, you know, between the band and all that stuff, you know. It keeps you going. Last time I saw Scott was at the Bowery Ballroom show. Like I said, it was great. He was so happy and it was just an awesome night out. But um, the time before that that I saw him was like a year earlier and I was mixing the new national record, the Sleep Well Beast record up at their studio just north of Hudson. And, you know, Scott was friends with Aaron because Aaron had produced their last record. So Scott came to visit one day, but it, it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't happy Scott. He seemed like really uncomfortable. And I remember we just, we, we were, again, not to get too much of a tangent here, but do you know the, the song System Only Dreams in Total Darkness? They don't, no, 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 no. And uh, so anyway, we spent probably six weeks mixing that record. That's how long National Records take to mix it. And we spent half the time on that song because people couldn't agree. But anyway, Scott was there for one of those days. And again, he just, he wasn't sort of himself and he was just sitting there kind of uncomfortable and and we'd just been working on the same part of the song over and over and finally we let the song run through to when the guitar solo kicks in and Scott's eyes lit up and he just went like, oh! And he's like, <laughs> oh my God, a guitar solo. He would never have let me do that. So he, <laughs> so he kind of ripped on Aaron in a really funny way. But I just, just to see the transformation, he just lit up, I was like, so it was pretty awesome. funny. So. That's a good friend as well, coming on a mixing day. Yeah. That's a good friend. Yeah. 
there's all sorts of sense memories that I have, like just thinking of these songs and those shows. And I think that's what's so beautiful about music is that it is porous and like it speaks to to the power of those songs that it has like entered everyone's lives. And I'm sure like anyone here would be able to answer that question also. Um, just the strange things that music triggers. I remember the smoking ban in the UK had come into effect on a Frightened Rabbit tour. So all the venues smelt like vinegar at best. <laughs> <laughs> and like just all of us joking about that. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful thing that we have that record anyway. And the wonderful thing that we have the occasion of gathering together to think about it because it's amazing. It's amazing the things and the smells that you get reminded of. Some of them positive. I also I think that there's something to it that that uh, every time they'd come to town, I, if I was in town, I'd, I'd go see them and I'd come backstage after, and there'd be this collection of friends that they'd picked up along the way. And I, I when I went through the record today, Oxford Collapse, Right on Dynamite, Peter Cadus, those are people. Generally, if I went to a Fright and Rabbit show, I might run into backstage, um, and maybe not the rest of the year. You know, maybe that would be the one time you'd see them. But, you know, yeah, I haven't seen you since the last show. <laughs> and I felt like they were good at keeping in touch and connecting with people. Mm -hmm. Yes, same, the sort of British version of that, like yeah. Fisker and uh, the people that are involved in this record. And, um, and ultimately, it's what you realize when people are gone. You know, the community that they've formed around themselves is it's what's left. Yeah. I also... Um, there's something I did want to say. And we did the tribute here in December. I don't know if any of you are here, but um, we did, there was four acts. We did three songs each, so that's 12 songs. We did two songs together, that's 14 songs. It's not that long of a show. And I, I got the feeling after we were done that people could have had more. And um, the sound guy put on this Modern Leper, the Modern Leper, and the audience sang, um, sang loudly, and sang together. It was possibly the most beautiful thing I've seen in, in all the times I've, I've spent playing music. It was incredibly emotional. And um, there was a thing in the event itself that, that, you know, I think all the artists, we were like, we got to keep it together. We got to keep it together. So we left the stage and, you know, no one was on stage. There was no one. And the crowd just took the thing over. And I, I can say we were all up there. Everyone was just openly weeping. Um, it was really, really a stunningly beautiful moment. And it felt like, to me, that the songs were kind of taken off the stage into the people, celebrated there, and then the people all walked out onto the street and sort of the songs were taken into the night and went with the people, you know, wherever they went. And uh, there was a real beauty in that. And uh, it's something I, I know I'll always remember. What I remember, though, too, is that was a really intense moment, but then it was, after that was an even weirder moment, and it was, it was more, it was weird. It, after that was done, do you remember the crowd started chanting, you know, the loneliness and the scream thing, whoa, yeah, yeah, whoa, yeah. and, you know, that's what the crowd would always chant for them to come back out for the encore. So, you know, just in my brain for a second, I thought, it, like, this sounds silly, but I thought it was possible. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. it, oh, no, you know what I mean, like, that... That hurt, you know, because yeah. I got this visceral thing like, they can come back, you know. So, I mean, for so long after Scott died, I just kept thinking, no, I just, like, I had, I had a dream that I dreamed it. I was like, thank God I just dreamed that. But it's, yeah, it's just, you know, and, and maybe the weird part of what we're doing all this is the, the heaviness of what happened to Scott. It's just so, it's so hard and so sad. But, you know, he was an awesome guy and he was a funny guy and he wouldn't want us moping around talking about it. So, you know, I don't want to get too, too down about it, but... Now, anybody out there want to ask these three any questions? We have a microphone and a person. Hi. So this question is for Peter. First, Hi Violet actually got me into like audio engineering and music production. So thank you for that. My question is: Is there anyone you're working with now that you think kind of carries on kind of the spirit of what Scott and Brian Rabbit were doing, just on a lyrical level or even on a musical level? That's a tough question. <laughs> I mean, hmm. hey Peter, I, what's better than the best? Right. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. I mean, I have a pretty long list of bands I've worked with. I mean, and Frightened Rabbit is right up there with just the most meaningful music. So I, I couldn't really answer that question, but it, it did make me think. Just in, in, you know, in response probably to what Craig was saying earlier about the the sound of the record and the production of the record, it's actually. I mean, in a way, it's very modest, it's very real, but it is, 
I intentionally made some of the sounds kind of macho. Like some, like if you listen to like Modern Leopard, like that bass drum isn't like a dunk or t- it's like yeah. a dunk, you know. And so, and there's not a lot of trickery on that record. There's, I mean, there are layers, but there aren't lots and lots of layers. Um, I think it's just a lot of like gain on stuff, a lot of, you know, compression and distortion on the drum room mics that make it sound like that. Someone actually said to me that they heard a song from, from an organ fight on the radio and they recognized the sound of my room. I mean, as someone who knew my room very well. Because there's so much room tone on that record. There's so much, you know, on the, like on the piano sounds and some of the acoustics and on the drums, certainly a lot of the songs have a lot of roominess. So... I was going to make a joke about High Violet, but I won't. But uh, no, and the Midnight Organ Fight, like a lot of records, it's, you know, in a lot of ways sonically flawed. I feel weird about when I hear certain things like, ooh, that could be better. But it's a magical record too. So, I, you know, I wouldn't change anything. Uh, even the, the DI on the piano, maybe that. But, um. I mean, I think Scott and the band themselves have kind of laid a, a map to answer that question in, in some ways. And the first person that came to my mind when you asked it was Julian Baker. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had the luxury of seeing her perform numerous times when I was playing with Courtney Barnett and she was opening. And yeah, there's, there's something about that kind of raucous, vulnerable power that I would draw a direct line to her. But it, yeah, it highlights the community and... I mean, kind of what being a fan means and part of why I'm a fan of bands is because of the gang kind of element, you know. It's more about the community that surrounds them as well that's enticing. It's like, oh, no way, they played on a record with them and then like they made that video and, oh, that's so cool. Like, I love that stuff. <laughs> so I think it's so wonderful the way that they assembled this record because it joins the dots for the American portion of like their touring friends that I didn't know and you know people that I know from other places that I didn't realize had such a strong connection with them it it kind of joins the dots of the rock and roll high school of it all all right so when, while recording this record was there anything that you stumbled upon that was like a happy accident or did you have any like creative liberties while creating this record Oh, that's a good question. Um, it was, you know, really done on the fly. Um, I'm trying to think of happy accidents. I don't know. I, I, I do remember thinking that we wanted to keep it kind of stripped down, so make the sounds that we have big, so the drums are all pretty aggressive on the record. Um, sometimes, <laughs> again, I shouldn't say things like this, but when I hear Modern Leopard, it's like, oh, those toms are a little over the top. You know, it's pretty, <laughs> pretty intense. But um, I'm trying to think. Of were, were you nine to five in it, or were you like five to nine in it? Like, Say what? Like, <laughs> were you nine to fiving it or five to nining it? Like, what's the um, vibe? I keep kind of business hours. You know, okay. I've been doing this a while. So, did now, they? Or <laughs> I think so. Yeah, bands are pretty good about. You know, I don't remember now because my now I work very civilized hours. But of course, a long time ago I worked terrible hours, and then it got slightly more civilized as every year went by. I think there were a lot, pretty long days, like twelve to eleven or something, or twelve to ten. That does qualify as civilized, in my opinion, or now it might not, but it, it did then. But the only guy I still work with who can't do it is, is Kurt Vile. So I always have an assistant who was willing to work until four in the morning. After I, <laughs> he wants to start it when I leave. But, um, but I'm trying to remember now, you know, again, I, I never really met the guys and um, we just jumped in. I'm trying to think, like one of the songs that took the most work was Backwards Walk. I remember sort of the the end of the song, we just put together that weird drum beat from samples and stuff. I was going to ask about that because I had to try and unput that together and put it back together again. (laughs) (laughs) It was, yeah, I remember just just sort of a random thing and it started coming together and then we just kept adding little things and then they went away, came back. And when I started mixing the song, I remember I very intentionally put the, the main electric guitar kind of low and then the acoustic is quite loud because that guitar just plays through the whole song, you know? And I remember the, the, the first thing was like, you got to turn up the guitar. And I was like, please don't make me turn it up yet. Let's just, let's let it live that way for a little while and let's see. Because that, I think that, that's what gave the song the chance to sort of build. Mm-hmm. If that was just like hammering you from the top, I think it would have been not as good. And then the end of the song, I remember the whole band's last day there. We actually did an overdub, two things at once, which is very rare. And um, it was Scott playing the Rhodes and he was playing that riff, ding, 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 I can't, I can't sing it, and, um, which he just made up. And I was in the back room with a guitar and a pedal doing like just weird little feedback swells, like hitting harmonics or whatever. And if you listen, I, I, can, I can hear them, but they're just, they're just little tiny things. And then the last thing after they left, like I st- it still didn't quite kick in enough at the end. So 
I played bass on it, and uh, this is not super interesting, but I still marvel at it when I hear it, is that when the bass kicks in at the end, you would, I would swear to God, it's do 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 that I'm playing, uh, you know, downstroke eighth notes. I'm just playing whole notes on the bass and letting them ring. And the song, I guess, pumps in a way that it just sounds like I'm going do 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 I think that's that's part of what's so moving about that song is that it's a song about being utterly stuck, but it's so propulsive, like in, in the way that it builds as well. Nesta, uh, who was the drummer in Skylark, and he came in to play drums on that, and it felt like a a nice belated thank you note to them for taking us on tour all those years ago. But yeah, I think he we did at least two drum tracks over the top to try and fit the drum thing that you guys had done. Yeah, um, and I, I really started building our version of it with the atmospherics, with that like sweaty room in mind. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this kind of thing, but I sampled your work because <laughs> some of the atmospheric swells are like me sampling the song and then playing it through all sorts of stuff. But, you know, sorry, Atlantic, if I wasn't supposed <laughs> to do that. But that's for a good cause. That's Fat Cat. There that's Fat Cat. Um, sort of on that note, I was wondering if when you were told or when you decided what songs you wanted to cover, if you knew exactly what you wanted to do or what the process was like of figuring out what your cover was going to look like or how similar to be or how different from the original? I know for myself, I uh, set aside a day in the studio with Josh Kaufman, who produces most of my stuff at this point, and we started the day by listening to the song a bunch of times and saying... Uh, what's your favorite part, you know, or what, what's one of your favorite parts? And, um, you know, I've, I've loved that song for many years, but um, that um, I believe in the house and the clouds. God's got his dead friends around. We, I loved that. I just kept going to that line. So we put that one up front um, in the version I did. And again, this is something I, I feel like I would have maybe a little more reverence <laughs> to not chop up the order of the song if, if Scott... Um, hadn't been alive at that time, but it just felt like let's have fun with it and let's let's move stuff around and let's uh, let's make it a celebration. So we we really started the day with a blank slate and built it up from there and um, and left at night with the song. It's so interesting you say, you know, would the version of be different? Because I I agree. Like I I can't imagine that my version would be the same. And I think that's why it's so difficult to talk about these things that are so sad because part of you feels like you should be still and reverential. And of course not. Of course you should chop it up and change it up and like keep this thing wriggling, you know? Um, and I, I think that's part of why I'm so grateful to be involved because it keeps it wriggling. I think I already talked about, yeah, when we were asked to do the song, what do I do with this? And so I just tried a whole bunch of different stuff end to end. And, but, and you know, the original song is, is a little bit of a mess. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would have felt a lot more pressure if I was asked to do Backwards Walk or Modern Leper or Heads and Head Rolls Off. So, yeah, I think the pressure was off. But if we'd been asked to do it after Scott died, then the pressure would have been on in a much heavier way, I think. So. And... There are so many other cover versions of those songs. You know, that's the wonderful thing about living in a YouTube era is that like everybody gets to express how they inhabit those songs. You know, if you hear it in a different way and you think, oh, this is the line I would put up front, then like it's perfectly within your power to do that and share with people. And that's really beautiful. I mean, I, I'm in the odd position of that Fright and Rapid actually covered covered one of my band songs, but it makes it, it's kind of embarrassing. It makes my our vocals feel a little square. So you know, <laughs> trying to compete with Scott. In fact, it was funny. I remember when they sent it for me to mix, and again, I hope they don't kill me if I hear this. It was really, really sloppy. So I spent a lot of time just lining things up because they did it fast. And then Scott didn't want his vocal to be too clean, so he just sent a completely overdriven mess of like re distortion and reverb. And I just wrote, I wrote, please send me the dry track too. And they did. And that's so then it ended up sounding reasonable, but it sounded totally insane before that. But the distorted thing is, is sort of the key to the track. But anyway, that was, yeah, that was a real honor for to do that. So I don't want to put you guys on the spot so you can pass, but do you have a favorite Midnight Organ Fight lyric? Tiny Changes is a pretty good fucking lyric, yeah. you know, so... Kind of puts it all together. Yeah. Uh, I need human heat uh, from the twist. Yeah. Uh, that that one. Uh, there's that, and then the you know, um, you're the shit, and I'm knee deep in it. Which are both these like 
crazy to me, very John Hughes 80s <laughs> moments, you know, like, yeah. like, like when those sort of, is it a drum machine or is it, it real drums that, that, that clicks in? I'm a, I'm a child of the 80s, so I, 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 that really, I remember that being something I really liked yeah. uh, when I first heard the record. And those lyrics, both of those connect really well. Yeah, it's, it's hard to beat. You're the shit and I'm knee deep in it. And especially just because of the way that the song builds and it's like, I've been telling you I'm stuck. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Oh no, actually it's this, you know, yeah. then it's completely. Also, there's a lot of just like a lot of my favorite lyricists, like you're the shit. And like, they're all really short, very yeah. easily understandable yeah, words, simple. percussive and simple and yeah. yeah. I also, I have a soft spot. I, 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 could, I'm a, I could sit here all night and be like, oh, but this one, but uh, I'm drunk, I'm drunk, and you're probably on pills. That, I just, I just yeah. yell that in my room. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the line after that is pretty great. We both have the same diseases. Yeah. It's a relevant girl. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, that whole song, and I, I think when I first heard that, I was, you, know, you won't find love in a hole. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I almost got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> we, if you had changed it, we might not be here. Yeah, no kidding. Like, so uh, that's why I, I didn't. I didn't. Thank God. <laughs> uh, anyone else have a question down here? Oh, right over here. Um, I just wanted to know how kind of fully formed were the songs on Midnight Organ Fight before the recording process was started? Uh, or, you know, obviously there's a lot of changes that go on in terms of the production, but... How, you know, was he rewriting stuff, rewriting lyrics, or how did that That's work? That's a good question. I mean, there were, there were full demos for all the songs. Have they ever been released or anything? I don't know. I'd be curious to go back. I'm assuming I still have those somewhere on the computer. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, the songs were pretty fully formed, but, you know, again, they were just a three-piece at the time. There was no bass player, and that record does have a lot of bass. So that, that was actually one of the fun parts is when, you know, Song was sounding good, but the minute you add sort of bass just in the chorus, it becomes much bigger and more excited. And we, I think we did some real bass guitar. We did some Hammond bass pedals, you know, little sub bassy stuff. Yeah, it's the kind of thing when it's not there, you're like, this is pretty good. But once you put it in, you can't imagine it not being there. And I think probably because we added all that stuff, they're like, hmm, I think we need another guy, you know. So <laughs> Was it vocals and guitar at the same time? Oh, no, no, no. no. no all the, yeah, mm -hmm. no, it wasn't that live. That, mm -hmm. No, that would be crazy. So. <laughs> Uh, we got time for one more, if there's one more. Hey, what's up? Scott made such personal music, and uh, for me personally, he died at 36 on my 36th birthday, which like hit me crazy hard. And I've been wondering, you know, as you progress in your career as an artist and you make work from a very personal place, how do you find ways to balance and kind of like protect your mental health in the process? That's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. I think it's important that the industry recognizes that it becomes more self-aware that the music industry is an industry of emotional labor. Um, and if you are setting up business to profit off artists' emotional labor, you should also be mindful of their mental health. And I think that's something that's culturally becoming a conversation that people are more ready to have. But you know, even the throwaway comment about civilized hours in the studio just speaks to how the fact that it is a, an industry of overexertion in every single way, both physical and mental. And it's, yeah, it, it can be rough. So we need to take a long, hard look at our practices. Absolutely. I, th I believe that the Tiny Changes uh, Foundation is, you know, aiming to keep those conversations going. Um, I know for myself, at some point, I just realized that like every day as an artist, you're either kind of, pushing the boulder up the hill or it's rolling down back on top of you. And you have to kind of wake up and make a decision what you're going to do. And, you know, it doesn't mean every day is pushing it, pushing it up, but uh, you have to have at least most of those days um, in a week. And uh, that can be therapy or, or talking to people, but also, in my case, exercise really helps and, and routine helps. Um, I find that I don't think people talk about this, but I find the tour bus to be like one of the most damaging things. Uh, not seeing how you get places, um, not seeing sunlight for a long time. I think that um, being on a tour bus, I, I really have found I prefer being in a van because you get to see where you're going and you see more. Even if you have to get out of bed earlier, you see more sun, and that's very helpful to me. But I think you know different people are different. But I think it's it's 
making the decision to work on your mental health as an artist is really important. And yeah, like I said, I have a 10 year old and sometimes he'll, when he's, he has a hard time, he'll say, you just don't understand. And I'll be like, I do understand because everyone feels like you feel. I mean, everyone struggles. And I mean, that's just a fact. And again, you, know, you bring up things like exercise or whatever. Just you, you have to find ways to, to control your mood, you know, and it's, it is a tricky thing. And it's tricky for absolutely everyone. It doesn't matter if your life is hard or your life is really good or whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. It could, life is still just so tricky. And just in terms of things like perspective, it's funny that what I've experienced sort of working with so many different bands and, and a lot of bands that are pretty successful. It's just, it's actually kind of funny to see like one band will say about that other band, oh, those fuckers, like they just got it made, you know, because blah, 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 for this reason, you know. And then literally that band will say about, the, I know, because I know them both about this other band, those fuckers, <laughs> they got it. You know, it's so, yeah, I mean. Well, that speaks to the problem, which is that there's a myth that you metabolize pain into art and art into profit and profit into happiness. And that is something that is, you know, just so damaging. If you can sit and look at the other band and be like, yeah, they've got it made and, you know, they're just struggling as just as much, you know. We just all keep working on it, yeah. Well, there's something I think is so kind of isolating and something I've really valued about being to, able to work with lots of different bands is that you have to, like, invent everything when you start a band. You kind of, like, start a family and a business and, like, grow this weird multi-headed organism together. Kind of just touring with other bands is the only time that you kind of share skills or, like, stories and, and support each other. And it can be... Anything can be inspirational. It can be from like how this band that's on next have coiled this, this cable into this loop pedal in front of us or like some kind of overarching philosophy that helps me on the road the next time I tour. Um, but it just feels like there isn't like the socialization between musicians and cross creative, you know, boundaries. I've got friends that work in film or that have similar struggles, but I would never have become their friend if I wasn't involved in music videos or something. It just, it seems like we all need to compare notes a lot more. Thank you all so much. Take care of each other. I think that's a big message of Scott's music. And uh, thanks to Katie and Craig and Peter for participating. Thank thanks you all thanks for coming. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Josh, that was such a great talk you put together, man. Thanks so much. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to do it. Craig Finn, Katie Harkin, Peter Cadis, thanks so much for joining us here on the TalkHouse podcast. Big shouts to Libby and Jack over at Atlantic. And thank you so much to Jill Wheeler and everybody else at Rough Trade who helped make this fantastic event happen. The front of house engineer at Rough Trade was Alex Payne. And today's episode was co-produced by Mark Yoshizumi. The TalkHouse theme song, as always, composed and performed by The Range. Make sure to follow at TalkHouse on all socials and subscribe for future episodes of the show. Listeners, definitely put on the headphones and give Tiny Changes, a celebration of Frightened Rabbits, the Midnight Organ Fight, a good deep listen. It's just great stuff. And Josh, you wrote a very cool piece recently for Noisy about it as well. I did. It kind of dovetailed with this conversation and I, I spoke to Craig and Katie and Ben Gibbard, who's also on the record, and Julian Baker, who's also on the record, kind of about how they felt about Scott as a person and as a songwriter. Really nice piece there. Thanks, man. We just want to take a quick second to say that if anybody needs it, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline can be reached at 1-800-273-8255 or suicidepreventionlifeline.org. You can chat with someone online through that. Until next week, I'm Ellie Einhorn. I'm Josh Modell. Peace. Peace.